Do you believe in the skeleton? How would you tell people that besides? You first, first, first. How would you tell them? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure it's not this. Hey, the Dapper Dinosaur here, back in my Skost avatar, if you will. Today I'm going to be taking a look at some research that Bill Morgan has been promising to do for about three debates now, I think, but that he doesn't seem to have gotten around to, so I figured it was time for me to do Bill's research for him. Let's use some clips from his recent debate with Snake Was Right and see if we can do some of the research for Bill. I believe apes make apes, people make people, bacteria make Bacteria, ladybugs make ladybugs. See, the problem with this, Bill, is that those predictions aren't really novel predictions. Everyone predicts that. People who accept evolution predict that. People who accept your version of creationism accept that. People who don't know what they believe about the topic accept that. What creationism needs to do to make what a scientist would consider to be a prediction is make a prediction that we wouldn't otherwise expect to be true unless your ideas about creation are true. Making a prediction that everyone else also made based on their own ideas isn't useful in the scientific sense. However, macroevolution believes bacteria plus mutation plus time plus natural selection equals blue whales. No, no one says that, Bill. Or at least no one who's very well informed on the subject says that. Bacteria are not the ancestor of eukaryotes. Eukaryotes and bacteria share a common ancestor which was neither and was simpler than either of them is now. As far as your predictions, well we've already seen some and quite frankly you don't make predictions. You make observations that everyone else can make and then just claim that they're predictions. Mitochondrial DNA can teach us that everybody in that picture, everybody on the planet, has the same female ancestor. It goes back right to the the beginning, and they call her mitochondrial Eve, which I think is a very powerful argument for creation, that people make people. Scientists calling mitochondrial Eve, mitochondrial Eve, is no more evidence for the existence of a historical Eve than scientists calling the moons of Jupiter after the lovers of Zeus is evidence for the historical existence of Zeus. Scientists just name things in ways that they find clever or evocative or interesting or sometimes even just funny. It's not significant. So there is a parallel, though, between mitochondrial Eve and the biblical Eve, in that if, in fact, Eve from the Bible were a historical character, she might actually be mitochondrial Eve. But she doesn't actually have to be, even if she existed. See, mitochondrial Eve is the last female line ancestor that is shared by all humanity. So if, say, there were a flood, and Noah had his daughters-in-law with him, who are now the three women from whom all modern humans descend, if they had any ancestors in common in the matrilineal line, more close than Eve was to them, then that woman would actually be mitochondrial Eve and not Eve. See, mitochondria are organelles in the cell with their own DNA. As a rule, they're only passed down by females because only the ovum contains mitochondria. The sperm cell generally doesn't. In exceptionally rare circumstances, a sperm cell might end up with a mitochondrion, but it's so rare as to essentially be discounted. So between any group of humans, all they need to have a mitochondrial Eve is to share a female line ancestor at some point that was the one from whom all their mitochondria descend. The identity of this person can change. Humans fall into three main haplotypes for mitochondrial DNA. These are simply groups that are more closely related to each other than to outside groups. If all the members of two of these haplogroups were to either die off or simply fail to reproduce, then the single ancestor of the remaining haplogroup would become the new mitochondrial Eve. In fact, you could simply take that haplogroup as a subset of the population and figure out when their mitochondrial Eve existed, who would be different from the mitochondrial Eve of the whole human population or any other smaller subset of it. So this isn't actually proof of Eve at all. All it is, is the mathematical outworking of how descent works. To say a feather is like a scale, scales shed, feathers uh, do not, they're completely different uh, arrangements. I'm not sure where you get the idea that feathers don't shed. 
feathers shed. It's called molting. It's a very common process that all birds go through. Usually the bird in question will help pull some of these feathers out with its beak. And that's one of the things that birds are doing when you see them preening. While scales and feathers are in fact very different, they actually form in a similar way. In both birds and other reptiles with scales, the scale or feather in question forms from keratin concentrated at a placode, which initially starts out as a thickening of the skin. It's true that until recently, it wasn't actually known that reptiles had these placodes, other than birds. But in fact, recent studies have confirmed that they do, and that the structure of feathers and scales is very similar, except that in the feather development, certain genes have a more complicated sequence of signaling, which results in the more complicated morphology. And to believe that a reptile is the ancestor to a bird, I'll go real slow here, you need to believe scales became feathers. Well, since the difference between a scale and a feather is essentially all just down to the differences in when regulatory genes express themselves, and we know that mutations can cause those things to change, I don't see what the problem is in saying that a feather evolved from a scale. Front legs became wings. That is something that I covered in a previous video, What Good is Half a Wing? I'm going to leave a link to that, and you can check it up in the upper right-hand corner of the screen right now if you want to find out more about that. But suffice to say, this is not a big barrier. Back legs became perching feet. Bird feet are already almost identical to more primitive theropod feet. The only real difference is that the big toe, which in most theropods is just a dewclaw, in birds is bigger and is facing backwards so that the bird can clutch onto things like branches. Solid bones became hollow bones. This point here is actually one of the reasons I decided to make this video. I've seen Bill Morgan be told at least twice before this that dinosaurs typically had hollow bones, which is true. It's actually a pretty common trait in archosaurs. Pterosaurs also had it. In fact, many crocodile line archosaurs also had hollow bones. Not to the same extent as many dinosaurs, but still, they had them. In fact, this is a well-known fact that has been well-known for decades. There's really no excuse for Bill Morgan to be making this argument. The only thing I can think that he's thinking of is of lizards and other modern reptiles. But birds didn't evolve from lizards. Cold-blooded became warm-blooded. This is another point that you can really only make if you've never actually looked into the topic. There isn't really such a thing as a dichotomy between warm and cold-blooded animals. Animals have varying degrees of ability to control their body temperature, and really the only big difference between being warm-blooded and cold-blooded is essentially the rate of the metabolism. But we know from dinosaur histology, especially growth rings, which actually occur in many dinosaur bones, that dinosaurs must have had a very high metabolism in most cases, because a lot of them grew too rapidly to have a slow metabolism. With a high metabolism comes being warm-blooded, or at least being mesothermic, which is sort of a halfway house between the two. Further, the fact that many dinosaurs had feathers for insulation, because they obviously weren't using them for flight, is another reason we know that many dinosaurs are warm-blooded since cold-blooded animals can't really do much with insulating feathers. The diaphragm is lost, air sacs are gained. In fact, lizards do not have diaphragms. Diaphragms are only known in mammals. Lizards, like most other amniotes that aren't mammals, breathe in through contracting the rib cage with muscles attached from the spine to the rib. And my favorite was in my last debate, the respiration system. Reptiles breathe in, they breathe out. Birds have air sacs where every time they inhale or they exhale, they're pushing air through their lungs. So they get twice the air movement through their lungs. Uh, how in the world does a bellows system of a reptile evolve into a completely different respiration system in a bird without killing it? As it turns out, unidirectional airflow is actually found in alligators, monitor lizards, and iguanas. So it's actually not that unusual trait for reptiles. And there was a fossil found of an allosaurus, which had avian-like air sac scarring on its skeleton. So we know some theropods had this kind of respiration too. Granted, the presence of this unidirectional airflow in lizards is a very recent discovery, but if you're going to keep up on this stuff and do debates on it, it would behoove you to, you know, stay up to date so next up, we have a little statement from Snake Was Right asking Bill Morgan a question. Some, the respiratory some dinosaurs don't have feathers. Some dinosaurs do have right. feathers. Do you accept that some dinosaurs have feathers? No, absolutely not. Well, that's just denial of reality. Here's a list of dinosaurs that aren't birds for which positive evidence of feathers is known. In most cases, 
actually including feather impressions where the structure of the feathers can be seen, and in some cases, the structure is so well preserved that we can recover color information. Here we go. Ostromia crassicus, Avamimus portentosus, Sinoceropteryx prima, Fulicopus ieli, Protoarchaeopteryx robusta, Caudipteryx zui, Rehonavis ostromi, Shuvuia deserti, Bipiosaurus inexpectus, Sinornithosaurus mileni, Caudipteryx dongi, an unnamed Caudipteryx species, Microraptor zoinus, Nomingia gobiensis, a Cetacosaurus specimen of unknown species, Scansoriopteryx hylomani, Yishianosaurus longimanus, Dilong paradoxus, Pedopena dauhuguensis, Jinfengopteryx elegans, Juravenator starkey, Sinoscalopteryx gigas, Velociraptor mongoliensis, yeah, the one from Jurassic Park, Epidipteryx hui, Similocodipteryx yishianensis, Anchiornis hoxlei, Tian Yulong Confucius, Concavenator Corcovatus, Xiaotinga Zhengi, U Tyrannus Huali, Scuriomimus Albers Duerfi, Ornithomimus Edmontonicus, Lingyuansaurus Wangi, Eosinopteryx Revipenna, Jianxiangosaurus Yishianensis, Oronus Shui, Cheng Yu Raptor Yangi, Hulundodromius Zabicalicus, Sitipati Osmolske, Concoraptor Gracilis, Deinonychus mirificus, you know, the animal in Jurassic Park that Velociraptor was actually based on, Yi Chi, Ornithomimus, Zenyuan Long Suni, Dakotoraptor Steini, Apatoraptor Penatus, Zhen Huan Long Tengi, Sarkornis Sungi, Kaihang Zhuji, Jin Tiang Osaurus Genki, and Ambopteryx Longibrachium. That's over 50. At this point, there isn't a debate about whether non avian dinosaurs had feathers. No more than there's a debate over whether they had skulls. I have a definition of birds. Wings, feathers, hollow bones. Unfortunately for you, Bill, those are all features that can be found in non-bird dinosaurs. Okay. I have yet to see the uh, fossils of the feathers, and I will look that up. It's not the first time you said that you'd look this up. Have you checked, I don't know, Google or Wikipedia? Because it's trivially easy to find these fossils. Just type in feathered dinosaur fossil into a Google image search, and hundreds of pictures of fossil dinosaurs with feathers will show up. Oh, I love Archaeopteryx. Mm -hmm. I'm so old. I knew about Archaeopteryx before you were born. Uh, what's the by the evolutionary model. You know what Fiducia calls it, right? I yeah. even have slides on it. He calls it a bird, a true bird, a strong flyer. He calls it paleo babble to think it became, it came from a reptile. Not only is Alan Fiducia wrong about Archaeopteryx and bird evolution in general, but Bill, you're not even right about Alan Fiducia. Alan Fiducia does think the birds evolved from reptiles. He disagrees about what reptiles they evolved from. He thinks that they evolved from crocodile line archosaurs, you know, the Kurotarsalians, whereas every other working paleontologist pretty much knows that they evolved from dinosaurs, which are Avametatarsalian archosaurs. And you're wrong about the quote. He doesn't think that it's paleobabble that they evolved from reptiles because he thinks they did evolve from reptiles. He thinks it's paleobabble to say that Archaeopteryx was a ground-based dinosaur. He's partially right. It was probably a arboreal glider and not a ground-based animal, but it was definitely a dinosaur. And there's many more evolutionists who do not embrace Archaeopteryx as an ancestor to a bird. Well, yeah, that's because Archaeopteryx probably wasn't the ancestor to modern birds. It was relatively primitive as avialans go for the time. There are much more advanced avialans that are much closer to modern birds than Archaeopteryx was. But it still exemplified the transitional features between more primitive salurosaurs and more advanced avians. Do all birds have the same number of chromosomes? And if they didn't, I would tend to say, again, I'm an engineer, that they're not all related. Bill is using this to set up an argument that because birds might have different numbers of chromosomes, they couldn't all be descended from each other. But that's silly. In fact, birds do have differing numbers of chromosomes, but there are differing numbers of chromosomes in groups that creationists typically consider to be all related to each other, like the horse group. The reason horses and donkeys can't have fertile offspring is because they have different numbers of chromosomes. But that doesn't seem to be a barrier to creationists saying that they're related anyway. Well, that's the last argument from Bill that I'm going to be dealing with in this video. But i got to say, for someone who likes to say... I could look that up. You don't seem to have ever actually looked any of these things up, because verifying all the things that I've just said 
took literally seconds of Googling. That's all it took. We now live in a period of time when virtually any information is right at your fingertips. You can just find it. All you have to do is not ignore all the sources from actual science journals and just stick your head in the sand in creationist sources. Well, thank you for watching. If you like this, please hit the subscribe button and the little bell icon so that you're always notified when there's more Dapper Dino content. Also, I now have a Patreon. There are several different tiers, ranging from $1 all the way to $100, all with increasing levels of benefits. So if you really, really like what I do, why don't you check that out? The link is in the description, and maybe toss a little cash at me. Also, I'm getting extremely close to 1,000 subscribers. In fact, by the time you watch this, I may have already hit 1,000 subscribers. In which case, I'm going to be doing a 1,000 subscriber special stream. So stay tuned for that. How would you tell us about that? You first, first, first. How would you decide? Well, that's a question. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know.